I'm delighted to be here and thank you very much for the invitation to speak on something that's very close to my heart. Before I start, I just want to tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, my name is Julie Fox, as you know, and I was born into a family of very assimilated Jewish people. My father was a refugee from Nazi oppression. He actually came over in 1933, very soon after the Nazis came to power, and discovered that he had to re-qualify. He had to completely re-qualify in order to practice his profession of dentistry in this country, which put him back, I would say, about six years, which was hard considering it had been an eight-year course in Berlin. Um, my mother's family came over in the 1890s. Um, they were refugees from Russia and Poland, or whichever way the, the, the frontiers were in those days. And they started literally with nothing. Um, the story is that my great-grandfather said, it'll all be all right, the Lord will provide. And my grandfather, who was a little boy at the time, said, yes, he's providing me. And that little boy went on to become a successful manufacturer. And he did well. But he came speaking no English, with no money, and he worked and worked and worked until he could set up his own business. So, <clears throat> Having been brought up in this rather irreligious family, I would say that I was brought up as a Jewish agnostic, I married into an extremely orthodox family, which did create a certain amount of diversion. Um, but we worked out a way of life that could satisfy us as a family and gave us um, the spiritual basis we needed, quite honestly, to avoid the missionaries. There are always people who want to convert the Jews, and the Jews don't particularly want to be converted. So we decided when, when the missionaries came into view that it was time to actually start learning about Judaism and practicing some form of Judaism. So there we are. So, who are, who are we? We are a very small group in the population. In this country, which has 60 million or so people, there are about 300,000 Jews. In Islington, it's 1% of the population who admit to having a religious affiliation. Something like one third um, either said they have no religious affiliation or weren't prepared to say. Of the rest, um, more than half are Christian, 8% were Muslim, and 1% each Buddhist, Jewish, Hindu, and a few others. But, you know, we're, we're a very small part of the population. Um, we have a 3,000 year history, at least 3,000 years. We started as a nomadic sheep and goat herding people in the Middle East in the Fertile Crescent, which means that uh, there were armies traveling, there was trading going on around there. Um, and the The um, early literature is very much aligned to the, the literature and beliefs of the Babylonians. The, the, a lot of the myths, the creation myth is very similar. The flood story is very similar. And there are very many similarities um, as we discover more and more about the archaeology and culture. East, it's clear that we have very similar roots. 
in, in culture, in history, in literature, and in, in myth, in creation myths. We trace our ancestry back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as the, as the Muslims trace ancestry back to Abraham and Ishmael. We went as people during difficult economic times down to Egypt, where, as they say, we became a great nation and uh, aroused the suspicion of the ruling classes, and they enslaved us, set us to um, building the, the great store cities. We the story is that God finally remembered his covenant with Abraham, the covenant that um, he would make of Abraham's descendants a great multitude, as, well as, as many as the stars in the sky. And we were, we came out of Egypt, or as they call it in Hebrew, Mitzrayim, which means a very narrow place. And we came out of that very narrow place, which it is actually uh, very narrow, um, and spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness before settling in the promised land of Canaan. Thereafter, there's a checkered history of invasions, internal tribal conflicts, deportations, return, and um, culminating in the conquering of that area by the Greeks and Romans, and eventually the many rebellions against the Romans, which resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem around about 70 of the common era. I still don't say AD. Um, and although some some Jews stayed in, in the land, many, many more were expelled and became traders, refugees, whatever, over the whole of the Middle East and over Europe. But starting small, this is a recurring theme. You start, you start small and you settle and you create a new community. So that there were settlements and traders across Europe and the Middle East, and in fact, as far as far away as China, there's evidence that the Jews were in China, having come along the Silk Road in about probably 1100 of the Common Era, and they kept a, 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 a community going until the 19th century, which is an astonishing, astonishing um, achievement. In the UK, we came over with, with the Normans in 1066. Uh, we were expelled in 1190 for, for, the, for, the, um, for the reason that nobody likes moneylenders. If, if the host community refuses to get involved in lending money, somebody has to do it. And if you are excluded from agriculture and manufacturing, there's very little else you can do apart from um, trading in commodities. Um, we trickled back over the years and Cromwell in 1665 um, campaigned to readmit Jewish people. And it is permissible to break the commandments, to break the rules, in order to save a life. So if you're not allowed to drive on, on the Sabbath or on a festival, if somebody is sick and you need to get into hospital, you drive, or you saddle up your horse, or you do whatever you have to do to save that life, because life is important. I'm going to mention Jesus who was a remarkable and special teacher, but we don't regard him as a prophet. What we know of his teaching is more or less in accordance with Jewish values. 
uh, we believe that many of his teachings were hijacked and distorted by another religion for its own purposes. So that's, that's the way it is. Um, other characteristics of Judaism, Jewish worship patterns have changed radically over the, um, the three millennia, moving from a locally based sacrificial cult to a more spiritual religion over a period of 3,000 years. The changes have often happened as a result of terrible crises. When Jerusalem was destroyed and the people were taken to Babylon, um, by the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. And the people there realized that actually there were values and cultural aspects of Judaism that weren't really relevant to a geographically based faith. They, and they made it a much more spiritual faith that could be carried with you in your head and in your heart rather than being related to where you actually were. Um, in the Holy Land, round about the time of the Roman occupation, we have the development of rabbinic Judaism rather than the temple-based sacrificial cult, which was really exacerbated by the, the expulsion. And it became a yet more um, portable religion, much more based on the home, based in the synagogue rather than a big static temple with a lot of priests, led by rabbis who are teachers, not priests, they are teachers. Anybody can be a rabbi, but um, the most important thing is that you are taught by somebody else who's been a rabbi before you, and you form part of a link, you're a link in the chain of tradition and of learning. Synagogues are houses, they have three functions. They are houses of prayer, houses of learning, and houses of meeting. So they have three functions. But they're not, they're only places. They, they're not holy places. What makes them holy is the the prayer that goes on in them. Um, the rabbi is a teacher, some are more revered than others, but as in any place you get, some who are good and some who are not so good. So, um, and we pray as a community, not as individuals. It's more about praise than petition, and any petition must be on behalf of the community and in accordance with the laws of nature. So not a lot of miracles. Which, are, which go against the laws of nature. What we really say is that you make, you make your own miracles by being alert to possibilities, by understanding, by thinking creatively. And perhaps there's a divine spark in, in that process, but it's not God coming along and um, doing astonishing things not these days. Those, those, those days finished around about the time of the Exodus. Um, very important to recognize the Sabbath and the festivals. The Sabbath is the, uh, the, um, the seventh day, because on, the, the, the story is that God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. So we rest, we refrain from work, um, and we study, and the most important symbol of this is that if you can rest, it means you're a free person, you have liberty. The freedom is tremendously important in Judaism, that we are free to agree, to disagree, we are free to do what we want. It's very interesting the story of Adam and Eve is regarded by the Catholic Church as the fall of man from, from grace. You know, that Adam and Eve were disobedient and naughty. 
Now, if we are made in God's image, if we humans are made in God's image, every parent knows that if you say to a child, don't do that, guess what? <laughs> they will do it. So my feeling is, my reading of, of this story is that God knew perfectly well that if he said, you can do absolutely anything except eat the fruit of that tree, that would make it utterly irresistible to Adam and to Eve. And that was the beginning of free will, of decision making on our own. It wasn't actually about disobedience. It was actually God creating the situation in which free will could be created. And I think that's actually, it shows God in a much better light than being surprised that, that, that his, his creatures would, uh, would, would, would uh, do something that he hadn't sanctioned. I think it makes God much more understandable in a way. It's a small subject. So, and we say that the Sabbath has kept the Jews rather than the Jews keeping the Sabbath. Because if you have this wonderful festival, it starts on Friday evening, which involves rest and relaxation and learning and all the things that you haven't had time to do during the week, you really appreciate it. And you have, you have a party, you have something wonderful happening once a week. Like um, the festivals are mainly grounded in the agricultural year and, and or historical events. So we have Pesach, Passover, which is the anniversary of the exodus from Egypt. We have Shavuot, um, which is the anniversary of the granting of the law of Mount Sinai, the anniversary of the covenant and Sukkot, which is the harvest festival. And these were occasions when you would go up to Jerusalem to celebrate. We have the New Year and the Day of Atonement in the autumn after the harvest. We have Purim and Hanukkah, which are much later festivals, almost in historical times. Hanukkah particularly uh, dates back to the Greek occupation. So we are, as you say, people of the book, or if you prefer, people of the books. Literacy, education, and the importance of transmitting culture from one generation to the other, and the transmission of traditions in everyday life are absolutely core, so that you actually have a very literate population and a culturally sophisticated population who understand that many of the things that we do are symbolic. So that we're told not to, not to um, reap the corners of the fields, but to, let, to leave them for the poor. Now, if you're a farmer <coughs> and you know that this is part of your tradition, that it's, it's charity, it's giving the poor some respect, you're not actually giving them stuff, you're enabling them to, to glean for themselves. This is an important cultural idea. Okay, so we have a fundamental respect for God's commandments. Rather than blind obedience, we have free will, we have culture, we value it. It's really important. And the respect for the law applies not only to Jewish law, but to the law of the land that we live in. And I think that's tremendously important as well. The law of the land is the law of the land. And um, that makes for a more harmonious society if we say, well, we're only going to agree with our particular kind of law and, and the heck with yours. That's, that's really a way to make yourself extremely unpopular. It's a really good way of creating social divisions and creating hatred. 
plants is not something that we want. We have to make sure that the operation of the law is fair, which means we need trained and expert judges. We need witnesses to make sure that it is fair and that the punishment should be in accordance with the crime. Capital punishment is extremely rare, maiming is unknown, and the idea of eye for eye, tooth for tooth, is actually a symbol for saying the severity of the, crime, of, of the recompense for a crime should be in proportion to the severity <coughs> of the crime. But it does not literally mean eye for eye, tooth for tooth, bone for bone. It doesn't mean that. That's, it's a real misinterpretation of, of, of the original. Sanctity of life, as I said, is tremendously important. And health and cleanliness um, derives from ritual purity. Um, or you could say that ritual purity has the side of effect of promoting hygiene and the promotion of health. So there's a great deal of um, washing in Jewish life. You wash your hands before a meal. You, you, um, you go to the ritual bath, the mikvah, to immerse yourself in living water in order to purify yourself. It has the side effect of purifying your body, but basically it's a, it's a religious, it's a spiritual experience. And if you have by accident um, eaten the wrong thing or put the wrong thing on your plates, you can actually immerse the plates in the mikvah as a symbol of purification. But cleanliness is physically important and spiritually important. And, and I think that has been uh, something that sometimes the host community didn't always understand because it didn't mean that, that people, Jewish people didn't necessarily get some of the diseases, cholera and so forth. Nobody's immune from these things, but there's a statistical probability that you will be less likely to be ill. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the food laws, um, you don't mix milk and meat at the, at the same dish, at the same meal, and it's just so that there's no danger, you will leave a period of time between eating milk and eating meat. Meat has to be slaughtered in a particularly humane way, with a very, by, by a highly trained slaughterer with very sharp knives and um, every effort is made not to frighten the animal but to treat it with respect. And animals that we eat must have both a cloven hoof, a, a, a hoof that divides into two, and tube curd, which means that animals which only have one of those characteristics are not kosher, which means suitable fit. Fish must have fins and scales, which rules out oysters, lobsters, and other shellfish, and quite a lot of other kinds of fish. Um, and one might ask, is this for health, or is this really to make distinctions between people who eat one kind of animal, and, and, or, what, or what, what is this about? My view is that it makes meals a spiritual experience, that it separates people from one another in, in communities. I myself don't keep kosher. It, for me, it, it means nothing, but up for other people, it's tremendously important. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to really talk now about variety of religious observance because you see me and uh, here I am wearing trousers and wearing ordinary clothes that people often think that Jews are the ones who wear these funny hats and the black dressing gowns and the white stockings. Very, there are very few people who are ultra-Orthodox 
they're not Kohen. They, 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 the Hasidim, that they, they call themselves the righteous ones. And they have adopted these habits, dress, and a very observant, very um, specific habits. And they keep themselves very separate from other people. What can I say? Um, it's not a way of life that appeals to me. It's actually not a way of life that appeals to most Jewish people. Most Jewish people are indistinguishable from, you know, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know in a crowd who was Jewish and who wasn't. But just remember that there aren't that many of us. Um, the ones who dress in this very special way are very, very visible, and that's why people often think that that's who we are, we're not. The observance ranges from those who want to obey every one of the 613 commandments to those who, for whom Judaism is a matter of familiar foodstuffs, salt beef, bagels, grilled fish, traditional foods, what they like. And some are totally secular, some are agnostic, some are atheists, but we are born Jews. We, we become Jewish by birth, and by culture, and by conversion. Very few convert. It's not encouraged because it's difficult to be a Jew. It's wonderful, but it is difficult. And so you have a huge variety of standard of, of um, religious observance, just as you have, I'm sure, in the Muslim community, a huge variety of, 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 um, of, of, of religious habits and, and culture. In fact, one of the things that I've realized through my work with Sacre and these Muslim faiths is just how much variety there is in every single religion. Hindus are the same, Sikhs are the same, Muslims are the same, Jews are the same, Christians. You know, there's an old story of a Jew who was on death island. And when they came to rescue him, he built three huts. And they said to him, why, what are these three huts? And he said, I live in this one, that one is a synagogue. I said, what's the third one? He said, that's also a synagogue. That's the one I wouldn't be seen dead in. <laughs> so you can see that there's always, there's always a little bit of uh, needling of people. Uh, there's, there's, there's tremendous variety. Um, we have various family life rituals, circumcision for boys and seven days, eight days, I apologize, bar or bat mitzvah, which is a sort of coming of age at the age of 13 for boys, 12 girls. I had my bat mitzvah when I was 54. It doesn't matter when you actually have it, but it's when you become a grown up. So I came to it late, but I appreciate it even more. And the nice thing is that the numerological value of the word chayim, life, is 18, because every letter in Hebrew has a numerical value. And so chayim, chayim, which is life, has the value 18. So my bat mitzvah, my, my bat mitzvah was on my three times high birthday. There you go. It's fun. And I got a fountain pen, which is in accordance with our ancient tradition that children having bar and mitzvahs always seem to get lots of fountain pens. So, <coughs> what else? A huge variety of practice and belief. Many accretions belonging to the people uh, who were in different communities, from the Chinese to the North Africans to the Russians to the British to the Americans, 
it's huge, it's a huge variety of custom and practice. And one thing I really wanted to talk about tonight is the immigrant experience. We have a long history of being immigrants, of being strange and exotic, and people being suspicious of us. It happened to us particularly in the late 19th century when a lot of Russians and Poles came along, mostly Jews, but not all. And some were politically um, quite enthusiastic. Many of them um, just wanted to get out and live their own life in freedom. Some were anarchists, some were communists, you know, and they enjoyed the freedom that they have in this country. Um, and there was tremendous suspicion of these immigrants. You see, everybody in this country comes from somewhere else originally. It's only a matter of how many generations they've been here. My family's been here for one or two generations. People who came, the Normans, have been here for a thousand years. You know, the Celts and the, and the Picts and all that came from elsewhere. The yeah, Anglo-Saxons came from Saxony and Germany. Everybody is a bloody foreigner. We're all bloody foreigners. And the UK feels it has a tradition of welcoming refugees and immigrants. But really, it doesn't. It just gets used to them over a few generations. There's research in the United States that indicates that in the first generation, people want to settle down, they want to be part of the new society that they're in, but they, it takes a long time for them to learn the language and learn the habits of, of, of the new society that they're in. The second generation takes it for granted and thinks, I don't want to be involved with all that old fashioned stuff, all that thing about the homeland and where we came from and it's boring and I want to be part of the main, main society. Third generation thinks, my goodness, what have I missed out on? I want to find out more about my traditions, my heritage. And I think that happens universally with people who migrate. And the people who migrate are the ones with initiative, an entrepreneurial spirit, and courage. Let's, let's be quite clear on that. I think that people who migrate from one country to another are very brave, are really the, 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 the seed corn of entrepreneurism that every country needs. And the host, the new host country doesn't always appreciate this. British society, I'm sorry to say, is, it does have racist elements in it. And all us immigrant communities have felt that, have experienced it. But they get used to us in the end. I went to a presentation a few years ago at Muslim Welfare House and they were saying how difficult it was to be an immigrant. And I recognised that absolutely as the Jewish experience of 80, 90 years earlier. It was really, to me, it, it just confirmed everything <coughs> that where we are now is where the Islamic community in this country will be in another, in another generation or so. Be patient. Don't worry. We've had anti-Semitism. You have what is loosely called Islamophobia. It's the same thing. Dif different people, but it's the same, the same um, syndrome. And it goes away in time as they get used to us. So don't despair. If you integrate or keep your own identity. You can do that, but it's really important to learn that people learn language, that they understand customs, and that they retain their own 
culture, religion, whatever, so that we can all work together harmoniously within the law of the land and within the law of our religious grouping. Traditional and unconscious anti-Semitism particularly comes from church teachings because they know better than we do. Everybody thinks they know best. And we, nobody has the monopoly. It's really important to understand that we work best together when we understand each other, when we respect our rights to differ. The fact that we differ, the fact that we don't agree, is fine as long as we respect each other's right to hold those opinions. So I'm a great believer in adaptation, integration, assimilation, call it what you will, but we all live here and we all have to get on together. Otherwise it's extremely inconvenient and not at all pleasant. And, um, it wastes a lot of valuable time. Language, education, ambition. We all want the best for our children, or at least we want something that's better than we have. And uh, in conclusion, I believe that our two religions have a great deal in common, um, and also some fundamental differences. And I realize that whilst our two histories have a common ancestry, um, we are cousins. I'm not reminded of a, of a Hungarian joke here of two men who, who say they're going to share like brothers. And one says, No, I want half. Okay, <laughs> um, blind hatred and obstinacy brings its own reward in more blind hatred and obstinacy. You you get what you sow, you reap what you sow. We are, we have to work for peace. It doesn't come easily. We really do have to work. We have to work to overcome the difficulties that come from disagreeing. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of courage. But I think the rewards of, pe of a peaceful, life and a peaceful community are far outweighed by um, they far outweigh the difficulties of learning to accommodate one another and respect one another. We need to learn to compromise, we need to respect our differences. And nobody is right all the time. The world is composed of different people, just as with coins, we are all the same and yet each of us is different. We're not, we're not mechanically produced, we are each an individual person. And we should appreciate God's wisdom in creating different strands of humanity and seek our common ground, not that which divides us.